I'll do um, a dual thing. I'll be showing some uh, materials on the screen and then uh, writing some things in Blackboard. So let's just try and get back to physics. We've been discussing um, the last few days how to implement the relativistic hydrodynamic equations, or rather, the in more in depth, what issues and features do we have to worry about if we try to deal with equations that are of this truly nonlinear form, not non linearly degenerate, and some of the uh, peculiarities that we have to be mindful of. Um, we ended up describing the, the relativist, general relativistic hydrodynamic equations, and roughly at the end of yesterday's lecture, I indicated uh, how you would kind of interface different codes or different type of equations together, because we know some features uh, would behave in one way or another, and how to perhaps try and do the most efficient or, uh, way of, of that, or what would be an efficient uh, way to think things forward. So let me just try and, and do some connection with what some of the things that Sasha described, and then try and, and put things together uh, between what we would know of what we would think we would know with respect to implementing Einstein's equations and what different sources of um, uh, that in our system we might be interested in, in considering. So for the sake of the argument, I'm just going to pick a particular formulation of Einstein's equations just in this presentation, so I'm not going to go in depth. These are things that you would have seen uh, uh, described with Sasha. If you have any questions, please do uh, uh, ask me, uh, but let me just try and use this as a workhorse, because formally, uh, we're not going to be going into any depth. We're just going to be trying at least to understand how we, do, we present, present the equations or the systems we're trying to solve for. So consider uh, doing a problem where we're trying to do GR and include a source. That source is described by a fluid. That fluid material could be magnetized. So we're going to increase a little bit and then say a few things of uh, what happens if we have this uh, matter that is magnetized? And we, dis we discuss um, some cases, both Daniel and I, where the magnetization plays a significant role. These jets, uh, for instance, are, are uh, significantly tied to the existence of magnetic field and how the behavior of the gravitational part of the system channels or taps energy from both the gravitational field or, so in the case of an accreting black hole, or the dynamics that has been endowed in this star that of the collision of two neutron stars, um, that they provide some of the energy into the magnetic field, this magnetic field gets amplified, ordered in a particular way, and that launches a jet. So we, once we go in this, we recognize that Einstein's equations, as we said the other day, are coupled to the fluid in lower order terms, so we can keep them separate, so we would think of Einstein's equations this way. I'm presenting it in uh, the context of a generalized harmonic formulation, where we're choosing our coordinates to obey this relation with this H are some source functions that someone has to provide. Either you have a good idea of what they should be, if you're thinking of just pure harmonic formulation, these are zero, uh, or you can give uh, prescriptions for how these f source functions could evolve in time. And there is plenty of literature of that. Of that. If you are interested, let me know. I'll discuss more. But let's say formally, this is how we would think that we're choosing coordinates. The, these coordinates imply some constraints, which are that the left-hand side is equal to the source we're putting the right-hand side. So these constraints have to be zero. And the answer to the questions can be rewritten in this form. And here I'm adding a few terms. So this one is there to account for the fact that we're replacing gradients or derivatives, covariant derivatives of the trace of the Christoffel symbols by the sources instead. That allows us to write the system in symmetric hyperbolic form. And then I'm adding this piece. This piece is a trace reverse part of the matter field, the matter stress energy tensor, because I'm writing here not the Einstein tensor, but the Ricci tensor. So that's fine. We expected this to happen, to, to be there. This is the source. And then we are adding this extra piece. And this is a piece that is proportional to the constraints at the analytical level. We're adding it 
because numerically we were always going to be having some small violation of the constraints, and these evolution equations, which when satisfying the uh, constraints were satisfying, therefore, Einstein's equations ex uh, uh, explicitly, but when we violate the constraints a little bit, this introduced some constraint damping that will try and bring back the small violations to no violations at all, and this has been uh, instrumental, crucial in the ability of the community to study strongly gravitation systems. Sasha, I think, covers some of these, but if you have questions, I'm more than happy to go through uh, the description and what it is entailed here. I'll show you some example in a different context um, as, as well. Which you might so then the, now the big equations. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that we're introducing the ability or we're allowing for the, for the possibility that the uh, matter is magnetized. What is n? What n? Oh, this n? This n could be any, it's any time-like field that is completely arbitrary. In this particular case, this n is a normal to your foliation, which is, which is time-like, so you might as well use it. So anything, by definition, what you're doing is you're introducing, once, once the constraints are violating an asymmetry, you make going in one direction of time different from the opposite direction of time, and you want along the flow, provided you are violating the constraints, you're trying to come back to the constraint surface. So now I'm allowing for this, the matter to be electrodynamically uh, uh, charged, if you want. So if you actually consider as the generativity premise is that the Maxwell field is minimally coupled, then you can just go through the action uh, and derive what is the contribution to the stress and tensor of the interaction field, and that adds this piece. It's included here. So now our stress and tensor is all this. So we have to study and give a formulation of what we're going to do in this case. So I'll just uh, describe a little bit for you of that. Um, but let's say, let's put that uh, aside for the time being. We need an equation state, so someone has to provide an equation state. Yes. So for no reason. So I just picked one of them. If you, so I use both. Uh, well, I actually have used the, all three of them. Um, they are all, at this moment, very robust formulations to go and, and study um, strongly gravitation systems. But from the point of view of just a presentation, this is the easiest one, because I can keep using kind of standard index notation, and it's trivially uh, the case that you can just say, oh, if I, if I do something with the covariant derivative, because remember, the Einstein tensor, the rigid tensor, right, in the so-called the Donder form, uh, is written this way. So I have terms that involve the second derivative of my metric tensor. If I look at this, this is a symmetric hyper hyperbolic system. This is as, as nice as it could be. But I have this piece. So this piece is breaking that property. But if I now, let's say, choose the trace of the Christoffel to zero, then this, this is no longer there. So it is as nice as it can be from the point of view of, of the properties, mathematical properties of the system. And these are products of the Christoffel symbols. And these are products of the derivatives of the metric. But these are lower order terms. These only have first derivative of the metric. Here I have second derivatives, and I have second derivatives hidden here. And this way, I would need to do something. So either I set it to 0 or I set it to a different variable. Um, that's how I get rid of this one as being part or showing second derivatives of the metric. If you actually look at what's going on in the BSSN formulation, in the BSSN, you split things in 3 plus 1. And when you write things with respect to the derivative of the ij components, the components that are intrinsic to the hypersurface, you actually write something like this. And if you notice, BSSN introduces new variables for the three, and you're doing exactly the same thing. And in the end, this is what you're trying to address. You end up inducing evolution, evolution equations for the trace of the Christoffel symbol through a change of variables, and there you're asking a particular gauge choice that is convenient. But 
at the intrinsic level, you're doing exactly the same thing. You're trading this part for new variables, and then you have to give some uh, evolution to those variables. And the CC set four is very much the same, except that now the constraints are explicitly showing up. And then you can easily pick from here and introduce this constraint dumping. So they are, they are very tied to each other. But the one that has the simplest presentation is this one. But you can pick any one, and the same thing would, uh, the, the, everything we are saying here applies. Uh, so someone has to provide the equation state. So at the end of the uh, yesterday's lecture, uh, people were asking me, OK, who provides the equation state? That, that will depend on the problem you're trying to solve. So if you're solving for, say, a neutron star, uh, you need to provide the best equation state you can imagine is describing the star. One of the big unknowns nowadays is, is what is the equation of state of a neutron star? We don't know what it is. It's, it's at such a high density that it's completely detached from what we can do in the lab. So nuclear physicists calculate the best they can, and they tell you, well, they can extrapolate from the highest possible densities that they have, we have uh, accessible in the laboratory, plus some further calculations, some extrapolations. Uh, with those extrapolations, then you try to see if they are consistent with the maximum mass that are observed uh, in the universe. And then you play the game of what those could be. So you can do a reasonable good, good job for, in qualitative ways, uh, choosing an equation state that is this, of this form, provided this, this star, the star is cold, uh, with, particular, with a particular value here in gamma. But that ignores the fact that a neutral star would have a core, an interior, and a crust. Well, you can do a slightly better job by using several of these combined. So this is a piecewise polytrope equation state. And you can do, hopefully, even better if you take one of these tabulated equation states. But the idea is that at the end of the day, you have to solve for all of them, find out what the consequences are, observational consequences of the different options are, and then try and see what are the best, uh, what, what, is the, what observations are telling us might be the best choices. But that's a very open, open set. If, on the other hand, you're studying white dwarfs, then the stiffness of the fluid changes. Now you, the parameter here ch uh, is different. If you're studying a, uh, an ideal, uh, something that is well approximated by the ideal gas, then you uh, use that equation state, etc. So it depends. That's where the physics goes. And um, it's part of the formulation of the problem, or part of the unknown of the problem, and then you're going to search for possible, uh, for possible options. So let me just say, what do you want to say? Before that, um, let me just tell you a few things here. So let me pick up from that equation state, from that, that stress and tensor. So I'm going to rewrite it here. So this is in terms of the Faraday tensor. We need now an evolution equation, an equation of motion for this one. We describe equations of motion, if you want, for this. So this is for the, we need to satisfy this law. So that we're conserving the stress and tensor that comes from Bianchi identities. We need to satisfy this law because we're conserving matter. But who is going to determine for us uh, how the Faraday tensor is behaving, well, those will be given by, um, by Maxwell. But the coupling between the fluid and the matter, and so the fluid and the Faraday uh, field, is given by a norm's law. So you have to add here some suitable version of Ohm's law, which ties what the matter is doing with what the magnetic fields or the, the Faraday fields are doing. So if we extend the standard Ohm's law to the relativistic form, we would have a relation of this form. Which, as you see, we're coupling now fluid, the behavior of fluid elements with the Faraday tensor. Yes. Yes, 
Yeah, you, we can do that. That doesn't, fall, doesn't determine the equations yet, right? So imagine that this part, I'm going to call it TM. No, it depends. Now you're going to be putting physics there. So of course, what you're saying is this has to be true. Now, now let me forget all the indices just for the sake of uh, kind of schematics. So this equal to zero implies, of course, that dt matter plus dt, uh, let me just call it Faraday, em equal to zero. And of course, is this true that if I satisfy this equal to zero and that equal to zero, I'm satisfying this? But that doesn't mean that that's the case, because if you do that, you're breaking the coupling. But in the right problems, that may be precisely what you want to do. And in fact, we'll discuss one. And, and, and Daniel already showed one, which implicitly he was doing that. He was saying, this one we can ignore because it's just too weak of a contribution. So essentially, it's not there. So you forget about that one, and then you're just coming up with a new equation that is d of t equal to zero of this, only of the electromagnetic part. But that's a different equation from the, far, from the uh, Maxwell's equations. So this is introduced some new constraints, and this is how you come up with the force-free equations of motion. But in general, this is now our problem. So we have to, the coupling in order to so solve this equation comes from here. And so n this becomes a huge field in and on itself how, who provides this equation, this relation? Who provides Ohm's law? Just think again, just doing electrodynamics, and you have some charge uh, particles moving around. If you want to solve that problem, you're also going to have to specify some sort of Ohm's law, and that becomes the physics, right? The physics is in there, and in the initial conditions, plus the equations and motions that take the system forward to the future. So what do, do, what do people do here? Well, in some problems, you can have some sort of simpler description. Uh, we discuss one, which is the one that uh, Daniel described in detail, where we say, well, suppose the matter, suppose this part, the contribution to the stress tensor of the matter part is irrelevant with respect to the contributions here. So then this is gone, we are only satisfying that, and then we the force free, and I'll say a few more things about that uh, case. Imagine that we're talking about a star, so a star, in particular a neutron star. The star is there, this is hugely important, and this may be important, and we need to address it. So how do we prescribe this? So one thing we can do is, well, we don't know much about a neutron star, but if anything, it probably is well described by an, a very, very good conductor. We're gonna say that the conductivity is huge. In fact, we're gonna just, if we're gonna consider huge, we might as well consider it infinite. If we're going to consider it infinite, and we're going to have a relation that is well defined, then this thing has to go to zero at the same rate. So what we're going to say, if, if infinity, that's a whole, whole infinity, uh, then FAB, UB is zero. So this is so-called the ideal MHD approximation. Can ask, we can ask the question, what physically are we saying is happening here? So we have the Faraday tensor and dotted or contracting with UB, which is a time-like field, that's zero. But this is saying that if we are a fluid, and we're we have a fluid and we're moving with the fluid, and we we're carrying our, whatever, voltimeter or something, we're measuring zero electric field. So in the frame of the fluid, there is no electric field. So while we would have thought that here we have electric magnetic fields to deal with, at least in the frame of the fluid, the, f the fluid, there is no electric field whatsoever, and then we can simplify our prescription. So this one is, let me call it EB, and I'm using a lowercase e to not use a, an uppercase e to denote the electric field, because it's a, this is a special electric field, it's a field that is the, the, the fluid uh, velocity or an observer moving with the fluid observes. Associated to this, we can define, of course, the magnetic field. So this is the dual of the Faraday tensor multiplied by it or contracted with the fluid velocity. That's our magnetic field. And so too many. So this should be 
A, it should be A. So this is different from zero, and that's equal to zero. We can use these definitions, the, the electric and magnetic field, to rewrite the Faraday, tens Faraday tensor, and then plug that all in here, and rewrite the standard, the stretching tensor in terms of those fields. So if I do that, I, I want to show it for uh, this uh, purpose. We're saying TAB, and let me, let me also use that E is zero. So TAB, or replacing back here, will be So we have where we use So what have we done? We introduce those uh, vectors over here. Using these vectors over here, we can write the tensor in terms of combinations of U and E and B. So here we have the familiar part that would, if you write kind of in special relati relativity, uh, the Faraday tensor, and then you have in the T, and the T rows or column, the electric field, and in the purely spatial part, the magnetic field, this is just kind of the covariant way of writing precisely that. So we write this explicitly that our, our assumption of infinite conductivity, the electric field is zero. Once we do that, we arrived here. So let's just try and put our finger in a few of these terms. Let's think about this one. So this is saying that the magnetic field is multiplying the, uh, the, this part of the metric, the, 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 well, the metric tensor of the stress energy tensor, and it kind of looks like the P, right? So it has a contribution that comes together with the P. So this is kind of telling us that maybe I can, at least for schematic uh, hand-waving argument, we can call this magnetic pressure. And we see that we can actually do that here, this BC, it's coming here, and I can, of course, write this as one half plus one half, and this I add to the P, and this turns into P plus P magnetic. The other half I bring in here, and is a contribution to the energy of the, of the magnetic field. And one of you yesterday was saying, yes, one half B square is energy, and we knew that. And so it is natural to expect that one half B square, we can just consider it as part of the energy budget of the, our stress energy tensor. So that's as far as, so we're gonna come back to the force free in a bit, but that's as far as now the, uh, the definition of a GR plus magnetic hydrodynamics is concerned, we can write everything with respect to a single field, which is this magnetic field. If we want, we can also define the electric field, let's say in the same way we did here, well, let me just use the indices in the right way. So now the electric and magnetic fields are the fields that we will measure with respect to the normal to our foliation, not with respect to the fluid flow. But of course, there is a relation having to impose this to zero, and now the relationship between N and U, which knows about the, the lapse and the shift uh, that we're, we're, uh, we're dealing with, 
we can rewrite the electric field in terms of things that know about the magnetic field and the coordinate relations between all these objects. So as a result, if we write the resulting equations of motion, then uh, we have a single unknown, which is truly the magnetic field, and the electric field is are replaced, by, are replaced by relations that show up in the magnetic field again. So you put all that together, then the equations of motions come out to uh, things of this form. So you're going to look at, or you're going to find things that are familiar to what we described before. So this is the, the conservation of, uh, of, of, um, of mass or, or, or particle number density. And we have twiddles here because, well, twiddles have some, a little bit of a, an addition, perhaps not, not in D, of uh, the magnetic field. So this is just twiddle because notice that we have absorbed the square root of the, the volume element, the square root of H, or the square root of gamma that we had yesterday, and now put in a twiddle so that we see it in a, in a closer form. Now let's look at the equations of, of, of motion for the uh, momenta. The momenta now has a contribution of the energy of the magnetic field, but by and large, it follows the very same uh, expression. And now we have these things, as things get much more complicated and we see explicit the magnetic field, but we begin to see new things that we didn't have before. We have derivatives of our field. So here we have the, uh, the divergence of the magnetic field. Of course, you say, well, if the constraints are satisfied, this is zero, so it shouldn't be there. Then we have similar, this is like the energy. Now the equation of motion for a magnetic field is this one. And I, there, is a, there is another field that I haven't told you why it's there for. I'll tell you in a second. Let's for the moment forget about that one. Just take any phi that you see, or psi, whatever that, name, the, that Greek letter names is. Just throw it away, throw it every, everywhere that it shows. And keep the rest of the system. And ask the, ask the question, is that system hyperbolic? So we know what we should go and then check. Are they all eigenvalues real? Yes. OK, good. We're checking there. First, first, first uh, condition is satisfied. Do we have a complete set of eigenvectors? The answer is no. This stupid equation is such that we don't have a complete set of eigenvectors. Instead of having, so if you count, let's say we should have one variable here, three here, we have four, five, three more here, eight we have seven eigenvectors. So the system is degenerate, and if you put that in a computer as uh, advertised, it blows up in, our, in your face. And this is an interesting development from now on. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story because if you actually go and try to implement uh, a study, a magnetized system that involves matter, depending on which particular literature you, you, you pick, you're gonna go one way or in a completely opposite way. The traditional way, the kind of the astrophysicist way, was to say, oh, we have a problem. Let's try and understand what the problem is. And then you realize, remember they said, oh, oh this should be zero, uh, but it's there. If we have slight initial deviations of the constraint, when you analyze this degeneracy of the number of eigenvectors, it turns out that whenever you violate the constraints, that's when it's, the degeneracy plays, uh, the, the, uh, comes up. So you, the idea was, well, we must make sure that we don't violate the monopole constraint. So a new algorithm, an extremely complicated algorithm, in my taste, or for my taste, was created and became tremendously successful. I mean, I, I'm not disparaging in any way whatsoever this algorithm called the constraint transport algorithm. I just find it's one of the ugliest algorithms I've ever seen because it takes all your variables and put them in the way we describe, cell average, cell center, et cetera, in finite volumes. But this one said, no, no, not, let's not put it there where we put everything else. Let's stagger in space and time. The magic that happens, and this is a beautiful, in some sense, the algorithm, I don't know how they thought about it, is that you could have all the variables having their intrinsic errors. But when you ask, what is the evaluation of a, non, a not exact solution? So it's a numerical solution. What is the evaluation of the constraint? And it gives you zero to round off level. So it just so happened that you combine errors, you make the errors when you iterate be such that if you combine them in the, in the monopole constraint, you get a zero. Because of that, then you solve that problem. Uh, and again, lots of great results have been obtained that way, 
The problem is when you introduce mesh refinement. Because say you had a grid this way, and you're place it, placing right, roughly all your variables center here, all, but actually the magnetic field, the variables associated with the magnetic field are, are centered there. So someone comes now and says, okay, I now have a new grid where I have defined both in space and time. So this thing that before was off center, now it's center again because it's lying on, on one of the faces or one of the sides of your grid. So you need the very complicated re, kind of redistribution, say, of this average to actually live over there. So you actually split things and it's a horrible mess. But that doesn't mean that people haven't been able to do it. You, what you can do on the other hand, and this is the R detour, is just go back and say, what was the problem? Oh, the problem was that they have constraints. So let's try to control, control the constraint, and this is how one option is to add this field. So this field is a constraint dumping constraint, and it adds two things for you. One, the addition of the extra field introduces a new vector, which breaks the degeneracy of that R1. And in addition, you get a constraint transport. So let me just Imagine that for the time being that there are no charges, no current, you write Maxwell's equations this way. And let me just comp think of uh, the general case that we have both electric and magnetic field for the sake of the argument. So those are the Maxwell's equations in vacuum. These fields are analogous to having introduced the following or modify these equations in the following way. And what you're going to say is that phi and psi are identically zero if the constraints are satisfied. But if they are not, they're actually changing the equation a slightly bit. And then you say, well, what are they going to do? Well, further you do something else. I forgot. You're going to add here some minus, let's say, k db phi minus kappa db. Sorry. So if phi is identically equal to 0, phi and psi are identically equal to 0, you have changed nothing. But now you can ask, OK, what's going on if you actually, if they are slightly different from 0? What is the evolution equations? Because I added new fields, I have to provide some equations for them. So I can take, oh, sorry, it's not this way. Let's put a vector here, NB. Let's take another divergence here with respect to the R, the R index. So now when I put this here, the Faraday tensor is anti-symmetric, it goes away. So I just have the box equation acting, the box of phi, equal minus kappa the time derivative of phi, or the derivative along n of phi. And this is an equation that has exponentially decaying modes. So as a result, what you do when you enter the, uh, introduce this extra field, you, have, you introduce something that measures the violation of the constraints, and the constraints are violated, they slightly try to bring them back to zero. In this case, in the case of ideal MHD, that's this field here. And it enters throughout. It enters here, and, uh, there, etc. Because there is a pushback in what I said. This, by the way, with this uh, method, you have complete set of eigenvectors. You don't have to be messing around where you place the variables. You actually study many systems. And all the solutions seem to be fine. Except that there is some annoying thing in the background, which is some of these fields appear differentiated. And remember, we work very hard are trying to obtain equations of motions that had conservation form. So uh, we talk for several days of writing this way, say something like that in one dimension. Yesterday, when we were talking about relativistic aerodynamics, we found out that, OK, sometimes we have a source. So then conservation form is still maintained, but conservation is lost because we have now a source or a sink in the right-hand side. Well, you can prove that this, if this source, source and sink or sink does not have 
further derivatives of this field, you don't lose all the nice properties we discussed. But the moment the source has a derivative of this field, then it's not so clear. And, well, that's what we have there, right? We have a derivative of the field here, a derivative of the field there. It's a bit uncomfortable. So it's not 100% rigorous mathematics that it supports this way. Um, but, OK, that's the alternative way of doing things. Uh, and that's at least the way I do things. So any questions? No, so one of the fields would measure, remember said this is the case for uh, source free. So we have no uh, current, no charges. So if we have those two conditions, we have the monopole constraints, so no divergence of the magnetic field, but also no divergence of the electric field. So one measures one constraint, the other one measures the other one. But it could be extended if we have a source, then the source would be here, and then it would be satisfying the other constraint. So it would have this constraint. So the electric charge. So this is the constraints. Now the constraint will be measuring whether this is true, let's say, or uh, actually phi. Yeah. So wow, I went. I had a slide for this. So that's suppose. Yes. No, no, no. If you take away this field. And this, uh, so you take away this equation, then because the constraints are showing up, it's not, uh, uh, it's not um, strongly hyperbolic, because it loses one eigenvector. There are ways of improving it, and people uh, did do that. This is the so-called, even has a name, an eighth weight formulation, because they were trying to recover that extra eigenvector that was lost. And that's where you throw, why you throw in some of these, these constraints. But the price you pay, so I, th I think that the, the case is take this out, just remove this one and remove that one. So assume that the constraints are satisfied. That one for sure has this problem. It's not strongly hyperbolic. Now, if you say let's add that contribution, because after all, I'm in zero, and, and this contribution, if you ask, does that satisfy, is that strongly hyperbolic? The answer then is yes in that case. But you, the price you pay is that now you introduce a source that has a derivative of that field. So this is a formulation that was introduced by someone named Balsara, as far as I know. Um, and the push has always been, hey, wait a minute, now you have a source that is showing up. Um, what maybe all the effort you're putting in doing the, the shock tube, well, the, the Riemann problem correctly here, you're throwing it away because now your source is showing derivatives. So that's uh, kind of a, just a few slides on generativism magnetohydrodynamics. I should say, notice that we work hard to understand the Berger's equation. We work hard to understand the ultra-realistic uh, equation. I even showed you the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. I haven't gone there here, right? Well, it, they are a mess, but they are known. So you can actually look at formulations. People have worked really hard. And for this formulation and the other ones, um, and the same as the one we uh, described descri 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 yesterday, general relativity hydro, the eigen eigenvalues, eigen eigenvectors are known. So we can just pick it from there and then improve your code, make it more complicated because you now you have many more fields, but you can implement them. But remember, I did say that things get significantly more complicated. So imagine you're dealing with this one. Now you have, let's count again, 1 plus 3, 4 plus 1, 5 plus 3, 8 plus 1, 9. So now the, eigen the matrix that you have in your row solar is a 9 by 9 matrix. So things get significantly more messy. And this is why some of these other row, uh, Riemann solvers, approximate Riemann solvers, that only use a subset of the eigenvectors uh, are, 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 are typically the way to go, or the chosen methods. So with respect to this formulation, again, let's go back to that force free. This is what. Uh, what uh, uh, Daniel discussed when he talked about the, uh, for instance, the uh, uh, Blanford-Snag problem, and it's precisely the formulation that, for instance, we use to to uh, to show, come up with those the scenario where two binary black holes were created in these jets, two jets that I show you the first class, the first lecture. 
So there you're solving now the full uh, Einstein equations coupled with just the Faraday, just the uh, electrodynamic equations because of the assumption that we uh, discussed that this is irrelevant. Now, following your question, it's true, right? We never imposed for Faraday for the equa electrodynamic equation. So, in addition dynamic equations, we now have this condition. So this is the condition that if you actually plug this in here, this implies that FABJB is zero. I'm nothing but the Lorentz force. And it's because the Lorentz force is zero is the reason why the, the equations are known as the force-free equations. So let me, we can do this all covariantly, but let me just go uh, more in the standard three plus, three plus one language or even electro, uh, uh, um, fields on a flat space time. What does that mean? So remember the Lorentz force was like rho E plus Let me just make sure I don't. Right, so rho E plus J uh, curl B equals zero. So we can ask, what does, imp does that imply for uh, or rho? See, I use rho there, let me just use Q. The charge times the electric field plus the current the three current curl with your B, the, the vector of B field is zero. So the first thing we know is that if we dot this one with B, so this one in here, this is a vector is both orthogonal to J and B, so that goes away, and the next one is B with E is equal to zero. So this is something that Daniel described, B and E has to be orthogonal to each other. The other one is we can dot this with a vector that is orthogonal to um, J and B, and we are going to get that the equation of the motion, the, the, the current, has to satisfy something of this form. J is Q. Just by simply doing this uh, with a vector that is orthogonal to both B and J, we can obtain this relation. So that fixes for us a component of the, of the current that is both orthogonal to E and B. But there is another one that is parallel to B. Where do we get that from? Well, we can get it from this. This now has become a constraint. If you take the time derivative of this equation, that implies and it being zero implies something for this J along B, which is a horrible mess. Roughly speaking, J dot B, or the J along B, goes something along this form, E, No, oh, sorry. Which is delicate because now there's a piece of the current that will show up on the right hand side of the equations and it has the derivative. So we would have to move it to the left hand side. It's going to be part of the principal part. And we're going to have to analyze the hyperbolicity of that system. And if we do that, you're going to find out that it's not. It's not hyperbolic. And so this is very delicate. So in practice, what people do to a prescription that essentially does the following. So just get, so evolve Maxwell 
at any given step, either a full step or any previous step, you evolve. So of course you give initial data, so it's zero, you give initial data where E dot B is zero. That has to be satisfied. You take a step to the next time or next intermediate time. Every time you update the fields with just the Maxwell equations, you're not doing anything else. Sorry, Maxwell equations with this piece, with this, with this piece, with J. All right, I have to still tell you what this Q is. So Q is a divergence of E. That's a constraint. So you evolve Maxwell with just a portion of the current. After you're finished, you may be violating this condition because the part of the current that enforces this is one that has all these things that will break hyper the nice hyperbolic properties. But then you impose E dot B equal to zero. So I, you evolve E, you evolve B, then you see if E has a piece that is, orth that is parallel to B, and then you throw it away. And then you just continue. Last thing you need to uh, also check is that E has to be smaller than B, or smaller or equal. If E happens to be larger than B, then the system is impossible. I mean, it's just the eigenvalues become uh, imaginary, and then they will just blow up. So, and that happens. Daniel showed an argument from uh, on his lecture that this will have to happen somewhere. These are they come with physical names, but in reality, it's something that is going very wrong on the formulation. This, this, you generate these current sheets, and this is a place where you significantly dissipate energy. And first, physics needs to be added. And in simple applications, you don't have that physics added in. This is something that's still very much a, a source of research. Um, but okay, you live with that by saying, well, every time E gets to raise its head just above B, you shave it off. You take out some amount of E. And that's what you're thinking is that, okay, that's the energy that particles would have acquired from the electric field to be accelerated. So even though this model appears and is indeed very simplistic, it is kind of, as Daniel described, a building block of our understanding of possible jet structure. It's a building block of our understanding of a pulsar emission mechanism, et cetera, they're all uh, in there. And for instance, uh, Anatoly Spitkovsky, in the year 2006, evolved this system of equations this way on a flat background with a boundary describing a star and essentially describe what we nowadays is being used as kind of the workhorse description of how a pulsar is acting out. It's the, end, it's the description of an inner engine. And then there's lots of other work to try and understand how that translates into the curve, the light curves that people see. So any questions on that? That's a description, however, of a system that looks awfully simple. And as I said, in the case of, um, of uh, Spitkovsky in the pulsar problem, he used just flat space times and the star was there to provide a surface. If you look at something that is much more kind of dynamic and the strong gravitational fields are, are playing a role, then you have to consider integrating Einstein equations. The good thing is that when you look at these equations, these equations are what we call linearly degenerate. The eigenvalues are not depending on the solution. So everything uh, can be done without having to worry about this uh, flux conservative or high resolution shock capturing methods. And the movie I showed you the first day of two neutron stars coming together and generating these kind of waves, electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves, it was done with a code that implements these two equations, or these two sets of equations. So now let me go to another problem that is even simpler in some sense. So we went from the mess of hydrodynamics, relative magnetic hydrodynamics, to something that was simpler, which was a particular regime where uh, this piece is irrelevant and we could just use electrodynamic, electromagnetic interactions, and in the right regime, we could even simplify that to just the simplest possible field that we can think is just a scalar field. Uh, so a scalar field, um, let's say in, this, in, in, a, in a minimally coupled way, can be described by, say, this action. And I, I thought it was cute to show you at least one action if you haven't seen any in, in, the, in the course so far. So if we're thinking of a, either a real or a complex scalar field, then the uh, action 
for the couple problem would be just a standard Einstein Hilbert action plus some contribution. And this, it would be complex conjugate or not, depending where it's a real field or not. And some potential. So an example of that is actions. So actions are scatter fields that people are considering. Some of you are working in cosmology. So these are purity models for dark matter. And people are studying them very uh, intensely, both in the context of cosmology and the context of particle physics. And more recently, in the context of gravitational waves, because through instabilities of associated with curve, rotating curved black holes, you can rob energy from the rotating black hole, put it in the action field, and this could be a way, a mechanism that nature will have if these dark, if these, uh, dark particles are described by massive scatter fields to deplete the angular momentum of certain black holes depending on the mass of the action. So there are several interesting papers that people have put out saying if LIGO shows this kind of behavior within these uh, masses, uh, it might be an indication that nature does not necessarily produce black holes that are lowly spinning, but they started with high spin and this interaction lowered their spins in a significant way. So it's something that we're gonna hear next year. LIGO will take a full year's worth of data. Uh, several, maybe dozens of signals will be uh, obtained. And the analysis of the, of the signals will kind of firm up this possibility. So if you actually have paid attention, the 10 black holes, the 10 minor black holes that LIGO have seen so far, if you ask at the end of the day how much angular momentum the projected along the orbital angular momentum of the system was provided by the individual black holes, it tends to be small. Of course, the, the, the simplest answer for that is that, okay, the black holes have arbitrary spin, but they are pointing not along the orbital angular momentum. That's the simplest answer. The curated answer is, no, some other uh, uh, interaction in nature has depleted the angular momentum of this black hole. That would be not necessarily the most um, likely scenario. But if LIGO here comes up with, say, 100 binary black holes, and they are all, we keep seeing them be having low spin projected along the, the orbital momentum, this possibility will go from a cute idea to, holy cow, this might be the answer. So that was a side of why would you might want to be interested in this. I'll describe some more in a second for a different uh, connotation. So there, you, what are the equations of motion? The equations of motion will be the Einstein's equations. And of course, the equations govern the scalar field, which is, if we look at the principal part, okay, that's a box equation plus some potential. Someone has to give the potential. The standard the stationary tensor associated to the scalar field is given by this. And we're in as nice a scenario as we can think of because this equation essentially give us box, I mean, second, uh, hy uh, second equations for, second hyperbolic equations for the metric tensor, and this one is a second uh, order equation for the scalar field, and we would just integrate everything in the same footing. One other reason that people are considering this kind of uh, uh, scalar field is because they, you could make up alternative compact objects. So, yes? What's the expected value of the, the action mass? It has a huge range, and then different experiments will be targeted. So different observations will be targeted in different masses. Like the observation, so there is significant evidence. It's, it's secondary, but significant evidence nonetheless that supermassive binary, supermassive black holes at the center of the galaxy, some of them have significantly high spins. So that already excludes or puts significant constraints in masses of the action where it's associated Compton wavelength because to trigger the instability but to be able to extract energy from the rotating black hole, the associated Compton wavelength of this particle should be roughly of the same order of the size of your black hole. So a size of black holes of 10 to the 6 solar masses, first the fact that we have seen spin in, in such a black hole restricts significantly the fact that the action better don't have that mass that is, will give you a Compton wavelength comparable to that. Of course, that's a supermassive black hole. A third mass black hole is much different. We also have the same kind of evidence for highly spinning black holes of masses, 10 solar masses and below. So same, it's putting significant constraint for actions to have compact Compton wavelength of that order. But like we've seen black holes are slightly higher in mass. And so, and, and, but we, and in those cases, so far we have seen them with low spins. Of course, with 10 
you can easily have many that are kind of their spins and are not significantly aligned with the orbital momentum. But when you're talking about 100, and if you don't have evidence of some of them having significant angular momentum, either you're going to have to go to the formation mechanism of these black holes and answer why is it they don't have higher spins. And some of the formation mechanisms will naturally have high spins. So either you misalign them somehow, and that would be very hard, or you need another ingredient to extract the angular momentum. So, but another option that were that recent, uh, that at least close to me, that uh, or close to the themes of this workshop, that people are considering these scatter fields, like you can actually use them to comp to make compact objects that are neither neutron stars nor black holes, and these are kind of boson stars. Uh, this is their, their names, and with some parameters which are chosen by fiat, you say, well, let's imagine that nature provides these objects that have some mass and they have some interaction uh, uh, coupling that is given by, say, this parameter. So what kind of objects can, can we form? So there are different plots that depend, on, of course, in this free parameter. But if you adjust that parameter, you can have objects where the compaction, right, the mass divided by this characteristic length, begins to be of order a neutron star or a black hole. So remember, m over r, this compaction value for a black hole is 0.5. For a neutron star, it ranges from 0.0 something high to 0.2 uh, thereabouts. And these are boson stars that have precisely, and they're ranging over, over those parameters. And then the compaction the, uh, dependence uh, over the mass is roughly consistent with a neutron star. So if LIGO were to see a, a, a system that has a collision that looks very much like that in GR for a long time. There is no electromagnetic counterparts, and some things do not quite add up. They are not consistent with a black hole. Then something like this may be going on. And so as I, even just uh, trying to consider what else might be out there, uh, there is an interesting uh, amount of research coming on. And so as I said, the equations of motions are not too complicated. You can uh, put that together. And then you ask, OK, what new phenomenology could you have in such kind of systems? So something that was strange that we did it, and then it's one of these examples, without a simulation, we wouldn't have guessed this was possible, is something, let me just explain before I actually point to the, 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 the slide. So neutron star and black holes, we know we can have with rotation. In the case of black hole, we can have rotations up to maximum parameter A over M equal one. When neutron stars, we know we can have them rotating arbitrarily in a continuous, arbitrarily fast till the point of breakup, when it's rotating so fast that it's beginning to shed its own uh, outer layers. With these objects, you can ask, can I form rotating boson stars? And the answer is yes. But because you have a lot fewer degrees of freedom, this angular momentum is uh, quantified. Could have zero times something, one times that something, two, et cetera. So it comes in very discrete values. So this is a simulation that we did where you collide these two objects, so they are coming together, they are bringing their own intrinsic angular momentum together with the orbital angular momentum at the moment of collision. This happens in neutron stars. We see that neutron stars come together and they form an object that is very highly rotating, and you can measure the angular momentum, or if they form a black hole after the merger, you can measure that the angular momentum of the black hole is higher for rotating, black, rotating neutron stars than those that have lower neutron stars, and the same thing happens with black holes. You do this with neutron stars, with boson stars, and some cases, like the ones below, they merge and very quickly a black hole forms, and everything in the story looks very much like the bunny black hole. So the, cl the claim is that if this is sufficiently compact, it only emits in gravitational waves, also in scalar waves, but our detector is not measuring those waves. And if we look at the gravitational waves, they will look very much, for the right parameters, the same as those of our binary black hole. So it would be very different to tell them apart, because all through in spiral merger and ring down, they, looks awful, they, they can be made to look awfully close to a, some binary black hole system. Now, if you lower the compaction, this was a very compact star, but let's just lower it by a factor of two, then this thing happens. So this object comes together, it comes with a lot of angular momentum, it forms, and then you study this object, and this object is not, does not have angular momentum. So somehow the system does want to keep angular momentum. And what it does is send these two little blobs out to infinity at a speed that is very high, over half uh, the speed of light. 
So he just throws the angular momentum away. He says, I don't want to be rotating. Why? I have no idea. This is something we need to understand. But the good thing is that because it threw out all its angular momentum, the gravitational waves that are coming from these objects are very, very different than those from a neutron star that would be comparable to this case. So even without seeing the electromagnetic counterpart, if we were to get the after-merger gravitational wave, and we see it with a frequency that is very different from those expected from neutron stars, and it is because this having shed all its angular momentum is right in a very different frequency channel, then we can tell them apart. And this was, as I said, a complete surprise. We were not expecting that. So that was kind of one example of what happens if instead of the standard objects, we thought, we asked the question, what happened beyond the standard object? Let's ask the question, what happens beyond general relativity? And I'll give you some example. So beyond general relativity comes roughly, in my mind, in two big camps. There's a camp where everything is well-defined and one can ask true questions. There's another one where all the motivations are interesting, but something else happens and we'll talk in a bit. Of the first camp, when I said everything is well-defined, I mean you actually look at the, uh, analyze the uh, resulting uh, evolution equations, and you have a well-defined hyperbolic system, and you can ask the questions what happened dynamically. So an example is the so-called scalar tensor theories. It can, there are many incarnations. One option you might be familiar with R squared theories, so where you say the action is given by the standard. Hilbert, Einstein Hilbert action plus some parameters square. This one can be mapped into one of these. And there are many. Brands Dickey is an example. Many, many of these theories uh, can be uh, are, are related in a simple way. So if you look at the action written, now you have some choices. The typical way that people write it is it's the so called so Jordan frame. And it's called, called that like that because if you look at the Ricci scalar, it's multiplied by a function that depends on this X field. But then you can do a conformal uh, transformation that gets rid of that field and puts it somewhere else. And that's called the Einstein frame. So in the Einstein frame, this very action can be written this way, where now, OK, there is a, there is a constant factor here, which has to do with Newton constant, say, times uh, a slightly different scalar field for convenience. But now the coupling with matter, what in this case was done, was coupled by the, the matrix G, in the conformally coupled is coupled with this color field shows up explicitly. Then you can ask, like, what are the equations and motions of those? And this is what we get in the Einstein frame. And the reason we do it in the Einstein frame is because of this. If you actually look at the Einstein, at the equations of motion for the metric tensor, then you get the Einstein tensor coupled with two sources. One that will be your matter field let's say, and another one uh, is, would be a contribution of the scalar field, which is a standard uh, scalar field contribution. So when you analyze this equation, everything looks just as nice as it should be. So the equation of the motion for, now you see what are the equation of motion for the scalar field and your matter field, which we're calling TE here, so it's a matter field in the Einstein frame. So the, you have a box equation equal to something that depends on the scalar field coupled to the matter field or the matter stress energy tensor, the trace of the matter stress energy tensor. And the trace of the, ma the matter stress energy tensor, this if t equal to zero that we've been writing all along, picks up a contribution of the scalar field on this, this piece. So that's not so interesting. The interesting part is this one in the middle. This one has box of phi equals something that depends on phi times the trace of the energy tensor. So we have some, an equation that looks like so. Box of phi. And now let's, let me assume that at least uh, with respect to some given solution, in linear form, this will be a phi. Sorry, that will be a phi. So it will be something like the trace of your matter times some phi with some coupling value. So now if you ask, what is the structure of this equation? It is an equation of a, just a standard scalar field obeying a wave equation with a source that is proportional to the scalar field. So the combination of T and K, the cup, the tracing of the tensor, acts like the mass. 
If this mass is positive, everything is fine, everything is stable. But if this effective mass is negative, we have an instability. We have a tachyon. So something will have to change in a significantly rapid way. So these theories allow for a so-called phase transition, where an, with a, where an object described by the standard kind of matter description and a scatter field very small, for in the right conditions, we'll just have the scatter field go up by on a very intense number. And the consequences of that trans or, or that change are significant. What it does is renormalizes the Newton constant. So it becomes something times one plus this, I'm thinking of a binary here, but it's one plus the strength of this extra charge, of this extra value of the scatter field. If you have a binary, you also have dipolar radiation. So in gravitational, in general activity, we don't expect gravity, quadrupole radiation. This allows to radiate in the, in the dipole as well. And so as a result, the dynamics can change in a significant manner. So this is an example of a binary that came together uh, through a standard kind of in spiral. It, it looks kind of, kind of not very smooth. That's because it, there was some in, initial eccentricity in the, in the condition, initial conditions, but that's a matter. But here in, in black is the result for general activity. So these two objects coming together with the same mass in general activity will take this long to merge. So this is distance versus time. Now you begin increasing this coupling. And then for a very small change, then it's essentially the same. But then you make it stronger and stronger. And now the coupling uh, drives these objects to merge much more quickly. So what happened? This dipole radiation turns on and begins to extract significant energy from the system and angular momentum and just drive these objects to coalescence much more effectively or efficiently than in the general activity case. And there are other things that happen that again were uncovered only through numerical simulations. If you want to, if you, if you have some questions, ask me, but let me not go there. But this is an interesting example where the moment you open kind of the envelope or, or, or the box and say, well, what happens? Even in theories that are sufficiently close to general activity, things can be very different. And LIGO has given us these amazing opportunities to try and test some of these theories that, for different reasons, are potentially very interesting. So some of these theories have been introduced to try and say, well, what if dark energy is not some sort of extra energy that the universe has, but in reality, it's just an artifact of us trying to interpret things with the eyes of general activity, a theory, then in reality, is something else. So there is quite a bit of work on, on this front. But really, this is just a very, very small amount of the options or the, the amount of theory that is out there on extensions to general activity. There are many. The problem is that, remember, it was this other class. This is a class where I said, from a mathematical point of view, the definition of the theories are bad for one reason or another. So mathematically, they are still um, very unfortunate, especially in the context of us trying to understand and put things in the computer, where any suspicious thing would just make everything blow up. So I was, I was uh, describing, for instance, a case of um, magnetic hydrodynamics. I was telling them, I was telling you, even in a case that is sufficiently under control, you couldn't do a simulation unless you worked really hard at the formulation or at the algorithm level. So these theories are much more complex than that. So I'll just give you some examples. Uh, because there are way too many, but just as representative examples. So suppose you have uh, uh, some other uh, theories, and what you're, these ideas come from trying to explain dark matter, explain dark energy, or challenge some of the principles that have been used to create generativity in the first place. So one of, one of them was there is no preferred frame in the theory. So there is this interesting set of theories have, that have been written down by Ted Jacobson or, or Horash, Peter Hoshava, they say, well, let's give up Lorentz invariance. Why would you want to do that, even that has been well tested in, in, in the laboratory for uh, particle collisions? Well, that depends on what your taste is. But if you decide to go that way, then you, could you end up writing a theory like so. This theory has the rich scatter plus some new fields, and these fields are essentially measuring how much you're violating the theory in some sense. And then you have to deal with this. And this is a very complicated theory. It's not clear yet that it has a well-defined initial boundary value problem. And there is, a, there is some work to be done on the mathematical level to even say, 
do we have a chance to even try and start in this in a computer? There are something, some other ones like quadratic gravity. So now imagine you modify this in this way because after all you say, well, this piece of the einstein hilbert action was an action that had the lowest contribution with respect to a curvature tensor. What if we have a higher order? Why is, what if that thing is just simply the first term in an expansion that has many other contributions uh, coming from curvature tensor? And you can write something like that. Like that. But uh, then there are ones that einstein dilaton gauss Bonnet, where you say, well, what if I have, well, this is, um, it's included here in some ways. But let's just look at some specific examples. I'm going to put my finger as to things that we have been discussing that would make us pause. So let's take this case, the einstein dilaton gauss Bonnet. So I, I, I tell you, I, I just take my word for it. The equations of motion are now given by this. So we have the familiar Einstein tensor. Then we have a new tensor that comes from the contribution of a new field, this uh, dilaton field. If we look at what this is, it's this one. So you have the Riemann, the Ricci scatter times second derivatives of our scatter field. And then we have other contributions. So when I look at what I have in here, I have second derivatives of the metric. When I look at what I have in here, I have second derivatives of the metric times second derivatives of the field. That's much higher order. So I have second derivatives here. Here I have effectively fourth derivatives. So that's, that's complicated. And if when I look at what is the equations of motion for this guy, I have in the right hand side kind of combination of second derivatives square. So that, that is complicated. So I would have, let's say, g comma dot dot, the second time derivative of the metric here. And then in the right hand side, I have second derivative of the metric times second derivative of the scalar field. And my scalar field is, has second derivatives in this part. So remember when we say, well, in many cases they are nicely separated. Now here they're not separated at all. So we made this distinction where we said, we know how to do this problem, whoops, fine. We know how to do this problem, fine. Oops, sorry. But what we do if this object that depends on u and u comma x, this is much more complicated. And formally, mathematicians don't even have a well-defined way of studying this. So that's where this kind of theory is taking us. And so in many respects, people are beginning to try and understand these theories and see what one could do to confront them with observations way ahead where the theory lies, the mathematical theory and the computational theory for this. Let me give you yet another example. This dynamical churn Simons somehow is motivated by considerations in, in condensed matter in, in two plus one dimensions that are lifted to general activity. I turn, tend to use it to make fun of, but there is serious work uh, being done in this work. I just have a very good dear friend of mine, uh, an Argentinian, Argentinian, Nico, Nico Yunis, that likes this theory, and so I just like to tease him off or piss him off, so I always bring it up to just make fun of the theory, not Nico. So this theory comes out with an R field and very interesting or very complicated equations. So again, the equation of motion will be, imagine that this T is, so this T is uh, the, the standard uh, metric, uh, this distribution, but you can imagine it's zero. So the equation of motion is the Einstein tensor plus this tensor but, but let's look at what this tensor is. And this tensor in particular has the, der the derivative of the Riemann. So here I got two derivatives. As bad as it can get. You can just study this equation. So just take the equation in 1D. Another and you can, in two lines, argue this is completely insane. Um, but yet, uh, we're looking into that. Of course, the reason that one has in the back of one head is that this one has three derivatives because in a gradient expansion, in a long wavelength expansion, this would be subleading with respect to that one. The problem is that numerically, you're actually exciting all possible frequencies. So if there is a high frequency that can take off at arbitrarily high speeds, it will do so. So somehow, we need to react and come up with ideas of how to deal with that. Um, so yeah, that's the only comment I had there. 
Oops. So let me just make one more comment about what I just said. Because actually, I think the idea is very nice. And it's waiting for some new perspectives of how to do this. So suppose, and actually, I'm going to go back to an example we discussed. No one asked me when we were talking about relativity hydrodynamics why I didn't include uh, viscosity. Because after all, Navier Stokes have viscosity. If, we have if you are familiar with the Reynolds number, the concept of a Reynolds number, that's a concept that involves explicitly the ratio of density to viscosity. Why did we ever lose it? Why is it that we didn't discuss it? Well, the reason we didn't discuss it is the following. So let me just write, again, the stress, the simplest stress energy tensor that we uh, discuss, discuss. We're going to even consider the simplest equation of state, oh, sorry, rho plus p, that we can think of. I can even think of vacuum where, well, vacuum dust where p is, would be zero. And let's consider adding viscosity, just sheer viscosity. So we would add a term here that has a parameter coefficient times what? We, here is a shear. So it's the shear tensor of the velocity. So that, this will be describing where point by point we have kind of the fluid beginning to have differential relations with each other. So it's just where the viscosity will act. Because viscosity wants to reduce that. Now, viscosity is related to the derivative well, of the velocity. So there is a the trace that needs to be added and some projection orthogonal to the, the velocity. But let me just imagine that that's what it is. Now let's consider taking the equation of motion of that. So that would be take the div A of TV. So we, if we take the, 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 we would go through, we would get the terms we discuss, and we would um, take a derivative of that. But the derivative was a derivative of the derivative of U. So now what do, what is, what do we get? What are our equations? Because we have terms, again, schematically, in the left-hand side that have things like UA grad A, UB, and then we will have somewhere here grad A, grad A of UB. A little term that will show up. So what did we do? Did we turn our first advection equation into a wave equation? That doesn't make any sense. The problem is, and, and furthermore, if you actually do the um, characteristic analysis, you'll find out there will be things that will propagate a causally. So we even gave away causality if we actually write something like that. So what happened? Well, the, the thing that happened is that this is an effective description. In, our, in the back of our mind, we have a fluid that is described by a whole bunch of particles. These particles are average within some local domain that is sufficiently sh small for us to consider it a field at a, that given point, but it's sufficiently large that uh, the mean is smaller than that. So the fluid locally achieves equilibrium, and we can make sense of the temperature of the fluid here, the velocity, etc. So there is the idea that we're trying to do average. These averages begin to break if we go to sufficiently small distances. And so the, the, the way we write this is the assumption. It's called, in some, in some ways, it's a, some gradient expansion. Yes. Yeah, the same would apply. Yeah, it's, so I just push here because it's the simplest one. But yeah, bulk viscosity is the same because it also has a derivative of main fields. And the point is we're taking another derivative, so this, these things come up. But good, thanks. Thanks for that question. So the thing is that implicit in this description, and if we keep adding, so, well, let me just, one, someone say, well, wait a minute, maybe this problem would be fixed if you add the next order. Well, the next order will have some R coefficients, it's a set of coefficients, which indeed have derivatives of the shear. 
And now, but now you end up with grad of grad of grad of the velocity u, or the u field. But it is the case that, remember I said that you break causality and they are most superluminal. This piece in part fixes that problem, but itself adds new problem. So it's like, it looks like we're always kind of playing catch up. Implicitly, what we're assuming is if we, were, if we had control of the infinite number of terms, and we were to add them all up, we would have something sensible. But no one has read this inf written these infinite terms. And in fact, there are arguments that they will, this infinite series will never converge. But the great expansion of something in our, the back of our minds, everything has a, sh a typical length scale, and this is mean free path, and everything that involves higher and higher derivatives leading by the number of extra derivatives. So a term like this would scale like one over L square by a term like this scale of one over L. So these things that are explicitly used in analytical calculations of perturbative uh, kind of um, ace matrix calculations where you can just track down each contribution and never have to run with this problem. But numerically, if you put in the computer every single, at, at the level of the grid, you're, you're, you have something in delta x, and also here in delta x, that is always source. So one over x squared will be much larger than one over delta x, and this, any problem that may be there analytically just gets exacerbated by the numerics. So there are formulations, reformulations of this equation. The famous one is the so-called israel Stuart formulation that by fiat tries to control these higher frequencies. Uh, maybe that's the right idea. So we actually have a formulation, uh, a, a suggestion of how to do this. But I think there is, there is a possibility of fresh new ideas coming from a completely left field to deal with this. And all these problems I was mentioning here are a result of that. One keeps thinking, we keep thinking of the so-called effective field theory approach, which are the ones that add higher and higher derivatives, which is perfectly kosher, perfectly fine, if you are doing, thinking in the back of your mind that this is, 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 is actually applying you know, explicitly. But if you don't, because a numerical simulation will not be doing that, what do you do? And so this is a very open uh, question nowadays. So with that, I'll just, I'm gonna stop here. So I'm gonna first, Congratulate you for surviving three weeks of different speakers coming with all different uh, angles. I'm sure there were topics that made you feel very uncomfortable because you knew nothing about. If, that, if you think that's, that was a mistake from our part, at least it might have been a mistake, but it wasn't something we didn't plan. We actually wanted you to be, feel uncomfortable. We wanted you to hear things that you might have not heard otherwise. But we wanted to paint a picture that all this is coming together because of these wonderful opportunities, and you guys will be in it, like it or not. This revolution has happened, uh, we're part of it, it, and I'm to some degree jealous, I'm not 20 years younger because I think this is, is exploding. If you actually fail, as I said, uncomfortable, that should be the case. If you ever feel that you're in a room, this is all saying, if you're in a room where you understand everything, maybe you should be changing the room, because you're not gonna be learning anything new. Um, so I hope you did learn something new. Hopefully also there were things that you actually could connect with what you're doing and think of new ways to do what you're doing or things that you could do to add to your research. So from all of us, the organizers, Ricardo Thorne, Raphael Porto and myself, thanks to you for putting up with this. Thanks to all the speakers that came and gave their time. So I hope you had fun. We're gonna be in touch. We're gonna be here this afternoon, at least for however, time, however long you want us. Um, and hopefully uh, this, is, this will give you some good things to do and take home. Thank you. So any questions? We've completely destroyed the, you guys, you know, too tired. <laughs>